Good afternoon. Welcome. Małgorzata Bonikowska, the Center for International Relations. As always, every Tuesday, welcome to our Zoom the World, the series we comment the situation in the European Union, Europe and the world. And today we want to discuss Bulgaria. We do this series with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, Konrad Adenauer Foundation, which is a foundation also very active in Bulgaria. And we watched uh, carefully the elections Bulgarians, Bulgarians voted uh, last Sunday on the 4th of, Sun uh, of April when uh, Poland celebrated Easter. Uh, Bulgarians as Orthodox, they will celebrate Easter in the beginning of May. So that's why the voting took place uh, in a very particular day for us. And we already know results. It seems like, uh, well, before we uh, come into the, the details, let's introduce our guests first. Uh, Ingrid Shikova. Hello, Ingrid. Yes, you have to only unmute yourself. Professor Ingrid Shikova, uh, Sofia University, European uh, Studies Department. And um, Ingrid, you were also working as an expert uh, for many years for the European uh, Commission, for the European Union. So welcome to our program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for the and, invitation uh, to be here and to talk about Bulgaria and the elections and the situation. Exactly. That we do actually rarely. Bulgaria is not the number one country we discuss in Poland, um, which is a pity. And uh, the second guest is Alexander Durchev. Sashu, hello, welcome. Hello, hello, Mogusha. Nice uh, Alexander you. is um, having two heads, actually. He's an expert in Innovation in Politics Institute in Vienna, uh, the institute with whom we work, and we are um, a branch of the institute in Poland, and we cover also Baltic states. But Alexander also is a business guy. It's a, it's a person who is a president of the largest uh, communication company in Bulgaria, called All Channels. So congratulations for your business Thank you. as well. Thank you very much. And uh, Sasha is also teaching um, at uh, American University in Bulgaria. He did PhD there. So uh, let's uh, join forces to understand a little bit better what's going on in your country. So let me come back to the results. So we already know who won. It seems to be a complicated puzzle, actually, because you have a parliament composed of 240 seats, 240 MPs, and we have three new parties in the government, uh, in the parliament, which is already a wind of change. However, the winner with 26% is the, the ruling party of today, the government party of uh, the Prime Minister Boyko Borisov, which is a GERB party. So maybe Ingrid, first I will go to you. Could you comment on these results? What's coming out of this? <clears throat> Unmute yourself, please, Ingrid. Just press the right button. So maybe uh, before Ingrid, oh yes. Yeah, it's okay now. Uh, as you mentioned already, Malgo, um, the Bulgaria election on Sunday saw three new parties, uh, which represent, in fact, the anti-corruption protest of last summer. Uh, you know that during the summer there were a lot of protests in Bulgaria. Uh, in fact, the Prime Minister Boyko Borisov ruling party remained uh, the strongest single party, uh, but uh, I must say that uh, he has uh, slim chances of forming a government and staying in power. Uh, he has now about 26% of the votes, but there is no party uh, in this new parliament which would be ready to make a coalition with GERB, means with Borko Borisov. So you mean you mean to say that the party is so uh, uh, let's say hated by the other parties that uh, despite the victory, so the other parties are anti Borisov, uh, right? And uh, this uh, the so-called United Patriots, uh, the three more or less populist nationalistic parties, which were in the coalition during the last parliament, they are not now at the parliament, it means that he has no 
uh, let's say, parties which are ready to make a coalition of, with him. That is why uh, he asked during the night after the elections uh, to form an expert government, but I'm not sure it will happen uh, because uh, I, I don't think all the parties are ready for this, which is frankly said not very good for Bulgaria because we could enter in a cycle of uh, elections and elections and elections. Uh, right, that's, like, uh, that's... Uh, something like in uh, Italy during such a long period and have a very unstable or have a very unstable government. Uh, you know, maybe what is the procedure in Bulgaria? Uh, now the president should give the mandate to the first party, it means to Puerto Boriso party, to form the government. If they do not succeed to do this, then uh, the mandate will go to the second one. And the second one, as you know, is the big surprise for these elections. Uh, this is the party of this so-called, there is such a people, a very strange name for a political party. This is a new party led by TV showman Slavik Trifonov, which win 19%. Uh, and if he decide not to form a government, then a third attempt will be done with another party, the president will choose. And if at the end there is no party, we should go to new elections, which means that this process, uh, will, uh, for me, it will be unstable situation in Bulgaria during a long period. That's a little bit a narrative similar to Boyko Borisov, who uses this fact that he is stability, at least something. You may not be happy with him, but at least he guarantees stability. That's the narrative he's repeating also in the European Union towards his European uh, friends, because he's quite popular in the EU as uh, one of the longest leaders, actually. Um, but I want to ask now, Alexander, uh, as Ingrid said, we have several parties now in the in the parliament, mm, so it's uh, it's um, it's a complicated puzzle to form the government, right? So we have GERB of Boyko Borisov, the current party, the winner. However, maybe they will not be able to um, to form the government. We have this newcomer with eighteen and a half percent, which is there is such people party, which is I understand the leading opposition, and again we have. Uh, as Ingrid mentioned, uh, more like a showman uh, to be a leader of this party. Many people compare it to the Five Star Movement in Italy, that um, it is something similar, a gathering of people. Okay. But then we have socialists still, who used to be the, the, the primary opposition, but now they got only 15%, which is the worst result in their history. Uh, I don't need to remind you, Bulgaria was in the Soviet bloc, so the left was quite strong. And then we had we have also some other entities like uh, Democratic Bulgaria, 10%. We have Stand Up Mafia Out, interesting title, a leftist coalition with 5%. And we have a Turkish minority also with 9%. So Alexander, can you a little bit elaborate on that and tell us how you see all these entities and what is in your opinion possible? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gogo. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a clear signal from, uh, from uh, the Bulgarians that they want change and that they want change in the governance model in Bulgaria. And in fact, something that we should mention is in fact that uh, GERB lost almost a quarter of their voters, no matter they are the first party, the first and the most popular party, uh, they lost almost 25% from, uh, from the people that usually vote for them. Uh, the, the, the situation with uh, the socialist ex-communist party is much more severe. They lost almost half of their voters. And the same is with the Turkish minority party, which I would say is the most powerful and most influential party from the first years of the democracy in, in Bulgaria. And they lost also one fourth from their voters. And in fact, we have now three anti-establishment parties, which are uh, very volatile, very unstable, unfortunately. 
but they are the vote of the people that they really need change in uh, in Bulgaria. And so you we, understand it as an anti-establishment vote, generally speaking, oh yes. to yeah, put yeah, out the mainstream parties, the, mm -hmm. the parties who are earlier important, and to enter with newcomers, right? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, in, in summer, uh, there were three months of protests against the government and the government parties uh three of them and the for the, the turkish party which is under the, the curtains in most of the cases and uh these protests in, in fact were very intensive uh, quite big and in fact they formed uh the the this uh this party with a strange name which is mafia out or guerrillas out which sounds much more ridiculous but they are really uh, people that really want some change in the government, and I hope they will achieve it somehow. But from the name, we can also see what is the problem that uh, many people in Bulgaria, I think you included, you both included, were very pessimistic and very, you know, judging negatively what's, what, were, what was going on, as far as, as, especially as far as corruption and mafia yeah. uh, kind of network, right? Look, there is a hope now with uh, this strange, uh, situation in the parliament. Uh, and I uh, agree with Ingrid that it will be quite difficult for all of the parties to form uh, a government and maybe new uh, new elections are inevitable, in, in, oh, inevitable, sorry. Uh, but there is a hope. So it's obvious that people will somehow um, insist on this change and it will be very difficult for all of the new anti-establishment parties, which are very populistic, of course, to uh, to form a government without being again kicked off uh, from from the streets. And of course, in the same time, we have to stress that uh, with a formi formation similar to a five star movement in Italy, we also have a question of lack of experience of newcomers in politics. So who knows what politics will do to them but we have a question from the audience uh, ingrid maybe you can handle it do you think with these new elections uh, there will be also more nationalistic approach in bulgarian politics like this happens very often now in european union countries ingrid unmute yourself yes um, yes uh, i don't think so because in fact the three main nationalistic parties are out of the parliament now. Uh, it means that the so-called uh, DMRO, the Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, this is abbreviation, uh, which is a nationalistic party, and uh, another two, Volia and Marishki party, uh, these three parties are out now of the government. Uh, for example, of MRO, uh, we know only 3%, 365 or something like that. And uh, I'm sure that this party was watched outside Bulgaria because this had been driving force in the administration to, let, let's say, to stop the beginning of negotiations with North Macedonia. Right. Let us just remind our viewers, and thanks, uh, Teodora, to remind us that Bulgaria has a system with this 4% of the threshold. Yes. So yes. any party who doesn't come this percentage is not in the parliament. Yes. Uh, then I, my answer is no, although some of these new, so-called new parties, uh, especially the party of there is such people, uh, maybe I should mention that at the beginning, Slavik Trifonov wanted to call his party, there is no such a state. Oh. But the court decided that such a name for a party is... <laughs> but what does it mean? Acceptable. Can you explain to us the meaning of this name and why the name is like this? Uh, because we have such expressions in Bulgaria, when you don't like something, you say there is no such a place, there is no such a, a state. <laughs> uh, it means it's very bad. And he wanted to stress that there is no such a straight uh, state in the world with such bad governance, let's say. 
but the, the judges decided that such a name is not acceptable for a party, and then he decided to call it There Are Such a People, which is strange as a name. Uh, but this is also a populistic party, in fact. Uh, not but this populism is in what sense? Why do you call it populist? Uh, you know, because uh, he plays for me with, uh, let's say, the, the feelings of people about patriotism, about uh, history, things like that, you know. And uh, he has, uh, let's say, the feeling and the, uh, how to attract people, to talk to them. Uh, during this show, he well, he is a showman, TV. so she, he should yes, know he's that. He's a showman, but it's very different to be a show, a good showman, and to be, let's say, in the parliament and govern a country. And this is for me the main question. But so I, that's a very interesting experience you will have. I want to ask Alexander because you also know people from this party, and you seem quite. Um, uh, optimist as far as what they propose. How would you describe this party uh, as a program, as a political line? Where are they on the political uh, scene? Look, this is maybe the most difficult question that I should answer because nobody knows what they propose. So they are the most silent party uh, from the beginning of the protest in the mid of the year. Nobody knows what is their opinion. Uh, so Slavi Trifonov, who is the leader of the party, just disappeared and he's appearing from time to time. So he's a very now very mysterious person. But he recently said he has COVID. Maybe that's the reason. He no, no, this is from yesterday. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the last few months, about no few months, about more than a half year. So uh, they somehow um, mm, expect that they will attract more attention being more silent and not uh, interfering in all of the uh, scandals, in all of the discussions between different political formations. And because they say anything, people are uh, imagining different things. You know, it's like a vacuum. So there is a vacuum and you're filling the vacuum with all your information and your expectations. So you are an expert in communication, Sasha, and you want to tell me that they speak less and yeah. less they speak better for them? Um, in this case, it's obvious. And in fact, they have their own television. And in fact, this television is now a political one it, uh, because he, can, uh, he comes from, he came from the biggest uh, private television. He, for many years, for dozens of years, he was the most popular showman in Bulgaria. So uh, he, he was just like the Bulgarian Jay Leno. And he moved to this television. He, he's the like a television fortress for his uh, team. And in fact, there is a team of 10 people around, around 10 people. So they run all of the organization now that they established in the beginning of the year. And in fact, nobody knows what the program is. So the television seems to be a very good uh, beginning for a politician. We have this case in Ukraine. We used to have this case in Italy with Berlusconi. Absolutely. Ingrid, do you believe he has a chance to become a prime minister? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, but uh, I'd like to add something uh, to this, what uh, Sasha said. Uh, you know, I think that the main problem of the, the campaign before the elections was that, in fact, there was no debate mm -hmm. among the leaders. Nope. And uh, I don't, as a, let's say, a citizen, I don't understand this leader who is uh, put on mute and do not want to discuss with the others. In fact, there was no such debate like, let's say, in US or let's say in France. You remember the big debate between Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen. And mm -hmm. I think that this debate, in fact, uh, let's say, decided the result. Uh, in Bulgaria, this was not the case. Nobody wanted to discuss with the other leaders. And this uh, silence of uh, the showmen 
uh, maybe it's mysterious, <laughs> as Sasha said, uh, but uh, if you decide to become politician, you should talk, and this is not the same to talk on the show, and this is not the same to talk on the debate with other leaders. Okay, so to conclude, we we just had elections. It will be very difficult to have a government. We have three new parties in the parliament and the nationalistic parties actually out. Uh, and we will maybe face an instability. But Sashu, my question to you is, you mentioned the protests. Uh, what is What are the major challenges, the major problems Bulgarians see in their countries. We uh, we have a survey showing us that there is a very high distrust in the gov uh, in Bulgaria to everyone. Distrust to the parliament, almost 70 percent. Distrust to the government, distrust to the judiciary system, even at the 50 percent. And also Bulgarians uh, are less and less. Uh, you know, by population, the population is uh, is diminishing. Uh, we also, before this show, this, this conversation, put some figures to our viewers that Bulgaria used to have in 2000 more than 8 million uh, inhabitants. Now it has less than 7 million and it drops. So, uh, Alexander, what are the Bulgarians' perception of their own country? Maybe it's time to, to, to start talking about Bulgarian yogurt and roses. <laughs> That's also a good thing to, to, to have and to remember about Bulgaria and wine and Poles. Uh, always we remember your beautiful sea coast. But now let's talk about <laughs> economy and politics. Okay, yeah, the big the, the, the distrust is everywhere. Yeah, it, it, it's true. So <laughs> we're quite pessimistic about, uh, about our future. Uh, Why? Um, because of many reasons, I don't know. Historically, we are not the most optimistic uh, country at all. But the pessimism comes from the discrepancy between uh, the expectations uh, from, uh, from maybe from the European Union as well, uh, and what's going on in Bulgaria. So there is a huge dis discrepancy from uh, from. Um, what we expected from European Union to, to, to somehow control our government and to control uh, the corruption, to punish the corruption. And now we have uh, European funds, which are obvious that they just disappear in Bulgaria and nobody is doing anything. So we have this situation in summer when uh, um, many uh, um, um, Many NGOs and people from the protests, uh, they uh, start communicating with Brussels and with the, uh, with the European institutions in order to uh, pay attention on these protests. And even Donald Tusk, the, 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 the People's Party uh, leader, uh, they said there is nothing wrong in Bulgaria. So this is an internal affair. And we so you see it as a problem. You see it as a, as a major a, yeah, yeah, let's say a, negative uh, negative aspect of the European Union that the yeah. EU doesn't do anything about it, right? Uh, yeah, you, uh, Europe. Yeah, of course, they they don't do because it's kind of a political issue for them. Because just like Orban and maybe Kaczynski uh, are part of uh, uh, People's Party, Orban is not anymore. But Kaczynski is not uh, not uh, in the People's Party, but uh, yes, I understand your argument that yeah. being in the so, European People's Party for Boyko Borisov yeah. was the argument to yeah. get friends yes. and to be protected. That's what you want to say, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, uh, there is a very difficult situation because uh, we have all these funds, and these funds are uh, giving a sugar to a, uh, to a, uh, on, to a cancer ill person. So they are coming to the country, uh, they create huge corruption, and this huge corruption you can see everywhere. So uh, there are infrastructural projects which are very poorly uh, managed. Uh, there are lots of money which nobody knows where they go. And in fact, uh, there is a huge impact on the business because you have uh, two types of business. You have a, a state closed uh, business, so business which is close to the government and you have uh, all other companies which are striving to survive in this situation. So in this uh, uh, situation, which somehow is, uh, um, in, in, which is also um, 
interfered by the COVID crisis uh, makes people really very, um, very suspicious, very negative, and um, the trust in government is very low. So it, 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 there are many, many factors that uh, really affect our life here in Bulgaria. And uh, we have several comments concerning um, the international position of Bulgaria and foreign policy, uh, but let's move first to the EU. Ingrid, you are the EU expert. Could you explain to us what is this kind of an issue that Bulgarians have with the EU? Because from, from what Alexander said, um, seems that in the case of Bulgaria, the EU enlargement, the accession of Bulgaria to the EU didn't really work so well as in case of Poland, for example. You know, there are several reasons for that. Uh, first, I agree with Sasha that um, high expectations were created before the accession. And some politicians uh, made a lot of propaganda that after the accession, everything in Bulgaria will be very rosy. Our salaries will be fixed. Yes, our salaries will be similar to the salaries in the other countries, etc. Uh, which was uh, not the case, of course. And uh, there is such a discrepancy. Uh, second, uh, we had no chance uh, joining the European Union in 2007, as you know, because uh, during the first years, years of our membership started the financial crisis. And uh, during this period, when Bulgaria was supposed to, let's say, to receive the, the fruits of the work to become member of the European Union, uh, there was this crisis, and in fact, the result was uh, disappointing. But I must stress, because I see here in the chat a question, is the Bulgarian society happy with the EU membership? Uh, I must say yes. It is. Yes, the Bulgaria, uh, as you know, in Bulgaria, there was no referendum about the accession because there was so high, uh, let's say, percentage of the Bulgarian, uh, more than 8%, which were for membership. For us, the membership in the European Union at the beginning, maybe not now, was something, let's say, more emotional, being back to Europe. Uh, after that, of course, uh, we started to, let's say, to see in the European Union more money, not rules, but money. We still uh, remember your minister crying when Bulgaria joined NATO. <laughs> this was yes. also a very emotional moment, right? Uh, yes, it's true. We are emotional, we Bulgarians. Oh, I know we, that. Yes, but we are also pessimistic. This is maybe the third reason but we trust more the European institutions than the Bulgarian one. And I must say from my own experience, when I worked at, uh, as director of the, the information center of the European Union, a lot of Bulgarians came to the center to complain <laughs> for different reasons. And when I explained them, but you know, go to the court. This is the European Union could not resolve your problem. Uh, they tell me, no, 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 we'd like to complain to the European Union, you should do something. Uh, the European In this Union... regard, you are similar to the Polish people. I guess we also <laughs> like to complain a yes. lot. And we continue to do this. A lot of Bulgarians, maybe not only to the European Union, also to the Council of Europe, of course, uh, and the human rights, etc. But we complain. Uh, I would like to stress another point. Bulgaria was accepted in the European Union with the so-called CVM. You know, cooperation and verification mechanism. Mm. Right. Together with Romania. And the idea was uh, there were several countries like Germany, uh, like the Netherlands, who said Bulgaria and Romania are not ready for membership uh, because of the judicial system, because of the corruption, etc. Uh, but you know, uh, we insisted too much, maybe. Uh, at the end, there was this decision to join 2007, but to have uh, 
the European Commission that proposed this to have this cooperation and the education mechanism with reports uh, every year. But what was the result? The European Commission promised that in one, two years, everything in Bulgaria and Romania will be okay with the judicial system. But in fact, this is not the case uh, because the so-called annual reports on the progress for accession before the membership were accepted very seriously. And a lot of journalists, if you remember, came to this presentation of the report that because there was a carrot and the carrot was the membership. And when we became members, reports, no more carrots. Yes. We just no eaten more. all the carrots. Yes. No more carrots. Uh, it means that, uh, okay, we receive a report, there are critics, uh, they do something in the government, and in one, two weeks, journalists stop to talk about this, and we expect the other report. The funds are for granted. Yes, so, yeah. yes. Uh, maybe one of the reasons to have now this uh, uh, proposal to have rule of law regulation about the funds also is the failure of this uh, cooperation and verification mechanism because it continues 14 years and the results are not brilliant. Right. So to sum up this part, uh, Bulgaria, unfortunately, is number one in the EU as far as the level of corruption. And in the same time, it's uh, uh, I think still uh, the poorest country of the European Union. So it means that in your case, really the accession didn't work so well because while you compare it with Poland, Poland definitely, you know, had this economic growth and corruption. We were able to uh, really eliminate almost this problem as far as, um, you know, in large extent. But I tell want us, to ask tell you- Tell us how you, how you did it. Uh, well, <laughs> exactly. That's a very good question. Maybe yes. we have other issues in uh, in our country. But coming back to Bulgaria, I want to ask you, um, uh, Alexander, now maybe we have a question about Russia. And I want to also stress that in the opinion polls, the perception of the European Union in Bulgaria is close to the perception of Russia because uh, Bulgarians are traditionally pro-Russian. That results from your history uh, in, in big part, I guess. But uh, Alexander, can you explain maybe how the Bulgarians see ra now this uh, Russian Western tension? Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I would add something to the, to the previous question uh, first. Uh, in fact, uh, the accession to European Union maybe is maybe the best thing happen, that happened to this country. So uh, it's obvious the, 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 big, the, the, the big support of people to, to the Europe, to European Union and to being members uh, of the Union. Uh, and I believe that um, especially the younger population, the younger people uh, are uh, really uh, pro-European, pro-Europeans. And when we talk about Russia, it's more about people which are above 50, 55 years old. So this is something from the past. And I think that people really, for, for most of the people, it's obvious the interference of the Russia in, uh, in the Bulgarian economic life. So uh, there is still maybe some memories from the past, which uh, somehow uh, um, makes some uh, specific part of the population very, very passionate about Russia. But I don't think this is the case, really. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure that really that there is an equal support uh, but who knows well the the opinion polls say that the positive perception of the eu is 77 percent of bulgarians yeah. and the positive perception of russia is 73 percent which is not far yeah. while the positive perception of the us and china it's much less it's around 50 plus percent so you can see the difference uh, yeah yeah okay Ingrid? No, you know, Margo, I would like to add something concerning Russia. Uh, you know that Bulgaria is very dependent on Russia, on energy, because without uh, having, let's say, energy from Russia, Bulgaria is <laughs> completely lost. I but do say. you see it as a problem? Do you uh, see it as a as a threat? and you try to do something about it or not? You know that uh, 
I must mention that relations between Bulgaria and Russia have become increasingly controversial in recent years. Uh, and you know this story about uh, the Russian diplomat uh, who was uh, persona non grata uh, two weeks ago and the arrest of six Bulgarians suspected of being involved in uh, uh, spying for uh, Moscow, etc. But at the same time, it should be noted that Bulgarian government was trying to balance and not to take too extreme positions towards Russia. Uh, and I think that this is mainly because we cannot ignore that country have huge dependence on Russian energy supplies. And you know that this third, the so-called Turkish stream, which is uh, gas pipeline, and we call it now Balkan stream, uh, is also, let's say, uh, the US are not very happy with this Balkan stream, but we continue to do this. Then uh, the balance is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, this relations. And let me ask you about Turkey also, because we, of course, have uh, Turkey as a candidate state formally to the European Union. However, we all know that, you know, the, the relationship is not uh, that easy between the European Union and Turkey. Uh, it has been a while. But in Bulgaria, we have a very active Turkish minority party. In um, On Sunday, they got 9% of the votes. So, Sasha, maybe you can explain to to us how is it possible that uh, this party gets such a good result? Uh, um, uh, I will again continue the, the the previous question. In fact, there are lots. Of, uh, it's a very serious Russian influence in our political life. So, uh, the nationalistic parties in Bulgaria they are supported by Russia. So, financially or in other way. So. Uh, I, so it's really not possible to avoid this Russian influence in Bulgaria. So it comes when we talk about um, a patriotic uh, narrative, it comes together with Russian influence. And uh, it, it's obvious how, in fact, the, the Bulgarian Socialist Party which is directly connected with, uh, with, with Russia. So it's traditionally very close to, to Russia. In fact, uh, when they start using this narrative, which is very patriotic and very uh, uh, anti-European narrative in the last elections, they lost the elections. Uh, and, and it's obvious that in Bulgaria, people really support European ideas. It doesn't mean that they oppose them to the Russian ones. I don't think they really understand uh, how these two uh, positions are opposing themselves. Uh, and talking about uh, uh, Turkey, uh, so for the, um, for the very first time for many years now, in fact, the Turkish party in Bulgaria received support from Erdogan. Till that moment, they didn't have almost no connection with Turkey. So it's a Bulgarian party with Turkish minority, which has his own agenda. Uh, they have their were very well connected with different businesses in, in Bulgaria, and in fact, uh, I I cannot say they uh, really somehow support the Turkish influence in Bulgaria till that moment. I don't know what will happen uh, with uh, this new support that they receive from Turkey, but till that moment, in fact, Turkey didn't have so serious influence in Bulgaria like, uh, for example, Russia had. Mm -hmm. Ingrid? I must add something about the rotating presidency of Bulgaria in 2018. Uh, when uh, Bulgaria succeeded to organize a high-level meeting in Varna uh, with Turkey, was very important. And Bulgaria, having more or less good relations with Turkey, because Turkey is our neighbor, and uh, there is a lot of trade between Bulgaria and Turkey. We have uh, economic interest, etc. And of course, we are interested to have stability on the Balkans and not to have on our border 
uh, let's say, a neighbor who is not stable or has, let's say, special relations like with Greece and the problems there, uh, that is why Bulgaria, I think, play and could play if we have good diplomats and good politicians, uh, um, let's say a role of uh, not exactly leader, but between the uh, European Union and Turkey, uh, there is a need for a country which understands the Turks and explain to our Western friends what does it mean. Because uh, I have the feeling that in some situations, uh, the leaders from Western Europe do not understand very well what happens on the Balkans. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is why <laughs> I think uh, we have on the Balkans our internal problems, of course, but also we are not uh, well understood by uh, our Western friends. And uh, here I should mention also the relations of Bulgaria with North Macedonia. I should mention Greece and North Macedonia, you know, during years and years there were problems, etc. At this moment we have a question, maybe I will quote it from Mr. Breyfus about um, some expectations you may have after the elections concerning the politics, the you know the the, the line, political line towards. You know, North I I was involved in our rotating presidency during 2018, and I must confess that Bulgaria put back on the scene the Western Balkans, because when we prepared this presidency and we suggested the priorities. Uh, let's say there was such a reaction in the European Union. Oh, the Western Balkans, we have a lot of problems, our pro internal problems in the European Union. This is not time now to talk about Western Balkans. But we insisted so much. At the end, there was Western Balkans was priority during our rotating presidency. There was a high level summit. I must tell you that we put a lot of effort to organize this uh, high level meeting summit with all the leaders from Western Balkans and the leaders from European Union. Could you imagine uh, on one table, let's say uh, the Prime Minister of Spain and the Prime Minister of Kosovo? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, special actions were needed in order to organize this meeting. And after all these efforts, for me also, it was very disappointing, uh, the relations with North Macedonia. Uh, but would you happened? expect now any change? Uh, frankly said, yes. But both North Macedonia and Bulgaria should uh, make some, let's say, compromises and uh, have a, a dialogue and not uh, only um, stay on this uh, historical <laughs> stories. Uh, uh, we have a treaty for cooperation uh, with North Macedonia. There is such a com historical commission with uh, people from uh, historians, etc. Uh, Let them to do their job. And yeah, but still, you know, I must say start. it's very popular now to have these historical issues. Yeah. Uh, also in Poland, we have historical policy and some tensions with the neighbors. Alexander, can you describe us a little bit how Bulgarians see the neighborhood? Because uh, Ingrid mentioned that you would like to play a role of a kind of a leader, maybe. And I remember also myself the EU summit on the Western Balkans, which took place in Sofia several years ago, not many years ago. Um, so, how do Bulgarians see this neighborhood? Look, it's a, uh, it's a quite complicated situation on the Balkans. So, we have one and the same historical books, and depending on which page you want to open the book, you can start a conversation with your neighbors. 
So you can say that in uh, 812, Bulgaria had uh, a huge territory and in fact, Macedonia is Bulgaria. So on the next page, Serbia uh, took half of the Bulgaria. On the next page, uh, Byzantium, in fact, owns all of the territories on the Balkans. So really it depends who is reading, the, who reads the, the, the book. And it's quite complicated. So uh, when we declare that uh, we would like the, to be the leaders uh, in this conversation, uh, uh, we should behave like this. And when we stop uh, the, uh, the, the, the negotiations of Macedonia being a European member, uh, it's uh, again another discrepancy from what we say and what we do. Uh, and in fact, it's quite difficult because we have now this artificial conflict with Macedonia. Macedonia has a conflict with, uh, with Greece, which is somehow manageable now. In the same situation, Romania is absorbing the, the whole business in, uh, in Bucharest, which is great for them, but nobody's paying attention that, in fact, we don't live in the past and we don't live in history in, in, in the books, but we should look forward. And looking forward means who will attract more investments uh, on Balkans. And in the past, before the crisis in 2008, Greece uh, was the one uh, that was responsible for this cluster as a business uh, as a business leader in the region. Today, this is Bucharest. And really, I don't care who had the biggest territory in the past, but I do care who will be the economical leader in on Balkans. So this is something that our politicians should take uh, into consideration, the new government, and they should somehow start uh, arguing about our uh, common past, but start looking for cooperation in the business sphere. And really it's, it's quite difficult and I'm really happy because uh, all of the nationalistic parties are out of the parliament. It doesn't mean that this conversation will stop immediately. It will continue existing somehow because these parties, they, uh, they uh, need this conversation to be uh, uh, active in the media and in the society because it helps them to be uh, in the parliament, in the next parliament. And I hope it won't happen, but this narrative will continue. And but, you know, the statistics show that there is this um, less and less investment for an investment in Bulgaria, as, as I mentioned already, there is less and less people in Bulgaria, because most of the many Bulgarians uh, use this mo moment, the, 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 the fact that Bulgaria joined the EU to, to, to quit, um, as many Poles left for the UK and Ireland, as you yeah. know, many Bulgarians. Uh, Ingrid, could you maybe explain to us, I mean, how the Bulgarians do you uh, do you know maybe the the, 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 the statistics concerning the vision? Uh, you said that you are neg pessimistic as a society, but now with this change, do you think that the Bulgarians can ch ch change this approach and can can see new changes and new chances in their own country, or it will continue this trend to leave the country to go to the west and quit will continue? You know, Margo. I must say that Bulgaria ranks among the top five pessimists in the world. Oh. But we are together, listen, with Hong Kong, with Italy, and with Poland. <laughs> uh, well, we are also quite pessimistic, I must say. Uh, yes. Maybe Italians are more yeah, often with us. Obviously, <laughs> we are more than you. Uh, this is according to Gallup International Survey at the end of last year. Uh, that, uh, I think that the hope is rather fragile. Uh, because uh, if you look at the data, you see that uh, only 16% of uh, surveyed Bulgarians believe that the coming year, it means 21, will be better than 2020, uh, and 45% think it will be even worse. Uh, yes. Maybe there, pandemic added to it as every, you yes, know, every of word. Of course, of course, the pandemic, because uh, the Bulgarian economy 
uh, was hit by COVID, especially some of uh, the negative growth balance was 4%. Uh, the coronavirus has seriously affected many sectors in Bulgarian economy, uh, especially uh, tourism. You know that the tourist sector in Bulgaria is very important and the tourist sector is pessimistic regarding the summer season too. Uh, the transport sector was badly hit by the pandemic. The owners of uh, restaurants, uh, etc. And uh, I think that all this also influenced the investments. Uh, you ask uh, why uh, Bulgarians are only 7 million. Uh, I think that Beyond there, now, 6.9. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, you know, uh, it's true that uh, after the changes in Bulgaria, a lot of people uh, went to US or to Western Europe. Um, the problem is that uh, a lot of, let's say, people who are at my age are here in Bulgaria, but their children are not in Bulgaria. And this is quite sad, as maybe this is also one of the reasons of the pessimism. And if you ask uh, all the generation, uh, almost everybody will tell you, I'd like to have my, my children back. I'd like to have a, a modern country um, with a prosperous economy because my children will be back. Uh, but I don't think so. Of course, some people were back uh, during COVID or during the financial crisis, but a lot of young people, uh, intelligent people who study abroad, they will never be back in Bulgaria. Uh, second reason is that people do not have jobs here in Bulgaria and they go to earn money. And uh, the figures are for a lot of money coming from people who work abroad. Uh, then uh, I don't think this tendency will be, let's say, the opposite. Before Bulgaria really become more active in the field of uh, economy and more prosperous with higher standard of living. Of course, young people, they prefer to find jobs somewhere and live in other conditions. We need uh, let better, me ask about, better education and better health system. I mm -hmm. think it's also very, very important. Education yeah. and health system. Yeah. But uh, Sasha, you are actually an example of a very successful career because you're in the business and your business has been growing in the recent decade. So if you can explain to us, uh, you didn't decide to quit Bulgaria, you do business uh, at home. Uh, how do you see the future and how much uh, change you would expect as far as this anti-corruption movement, as far as this new wave and new, you know, conditions also for the business, which can keep people in the country? Uh, so, Gogo, you know that I'm in Geneva. Uh, from but right now you are in yeah. Sofia and yeah. you keep yeah. traveling. Uh, fortunately for vacations. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, yes. The, the big word here and the biggest problem, it's not an issue anymore, it's a huge problem, is the word corruption. So the corruption is really a severe problem for Bulgaria, for the whole region, because it's not a Bulgarian invention. So the whole, uh, the whole Balkans have this very serious problem. And when you have corruption, it means there is no uh, uh, rule of law. Uh, there uh, uh, are no uh, no companies investing in such countries. There are no well-paid jobs. So uh, just before the crisis, we had one of the lowest uh, one of the lowest um, unemployment rate in Europe. It was less than two percent. But it wasn't because we have lots of uh, new new uh, jobs opened, but it's because of the emigration. Uh, but we had 2% and we experienced severe problem with uh, finding people in, in my company, not only in, in the communication business, but almost everywhere. So today uh, we have the same problem even in the, in the situation of Corona crisis when many people lost their jobs. So uh, the corruption is really a huge problem here. 
And yeah, maybe I'm relatively successful in what I'm doing, but honestly, it's very difficult. And from uh, year in a year, uh, the budgets are getting uh, less and less. Uh, it's very difficult to, to work with the international companies because most of them uh, are uh, moving their headquarters to uh, the neighborhood countries. And as I mentioned in Bucharest, in most of the cases. So it's really very difficult situation. And while we're talking about uh, nationalism, about Macedonia, any of the Macedonians are Bulgarians or no. So uh, most of the, 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 the investors are avoiding this country. So this is really a problem. And it's uh, maybe this is the explanation why we are still so pessimistic. And this discrepancy between expectations and the reality is quite big. So uh, that's why I mentioned somewhere European Union because we had this expectation that because we cannot deal with our uh, issues, we cannot deal with uh, the corruption internally. So we need this external help and this external help uh, doesn't come, which is absolutely normal, but people are expecting this to happen. So uh, from your, what you say, I understand that this, this European uh, factor is really crucial now to help Bulgaria with this change because the wind of change is there. We have yeah. some clear signs that people are determined to find somebody else to vote for newcomers. But without this external uh, uh, support uh, that you are on the right track, uh, the Bulgarian society itself, especially as far as corruption is concerned, uh, especially when we see the new EU funds coming um, much higher also because of the crisis, we have the, the special yep. anti-COVID right. fund. So this will be also a big question mark how Bulgaria um, is able to handle this money. Ingrid, last words uh, of your comment, please. I would like to add something positive about Bulgaria. It's true about the corruption. Uh, I agree with Sasha, but uh, you know, I think that corruption is everywhere. Uh, let's think about France, about Italy. Uh, I think that, uh, of course, we are Bulgarians, we are angry with this corruption, we are angry with the lack of rule of law. Uh, but um, at the same time, what is the positive, I think, to, to add a positive note to what we discussed. Uh, during the July last year, Bulgaria became um, part of ERM2, exchange rate mechanism 2, uh, which is called waiting room, I don't know why, to the Eurozone, it is more it is more a fitness room. <laughs> um, and I think this could help Bulgaria and uh, the country with the fight of corruption, because when you are in the Eurozone, there are much more mechanisms to control the budget, to control uh, the funds, etc. Uh, and I think this is the positive side of uh, membership as a European. That is why there are some people who are against. Of course, there are people who think that the prices will go up, etc. But for me, the membership in the Eurozone could help Bulgaria to fight with the corruption first and uh, to establish really rule of law. Because there are a lot of mechanisms now in the European Union with uh, the banking, we became members of the banking union, etc. And the control will be much more severe than now. Uh, that is why I think it's a positive sign for Bulgaria. So let's end on this positive note. Uh, we po political scientists describe Bulgaria as unconsolidated democracy. It's still under construction, let's say. So let's hope that these elections will bring, you know, some change to your country. We'll keep uh, fingers crossed for the government, whatever it will be, let's see. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, Ingrid Shikova, professor at Sofia University and the European Union expert. Ingrid, thank you very much. You're welcome, and, Aldo. We can do another talk also. Yes, let's uh, see, uh, maybe once you have a government. Yes. yes.
and Alexander Durchev, Dr. Durchev, thank you, Sashu. Uh, All Channels and Innovations in Politics Institute in Vienna, working from uh, Vienna, Sofia, and Geneva recently. Thank you, Sashu. Thank you, Margot. Thank you very much. And as always, I invite you for the next Tuesday, always five o'clock. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Okay, goodbye.